Welcome back. You're watching Global Today. This is the final tail end of it. And we wanted to cross over to DR Congo, where United Nations peacekeepers in the Democratic Republic of Congo will begin departing the country in an accelerated withdrawal. The Global Bodies Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, says, confirming the departure of one of the missions first deployed 25 years ago. In a report table to the UN Security Council, Guterres says the stabilization mission deployed to the DR Congo and known by its French acronym MONUSCO will leave the country, concluding a controversial chapter, but potentially leaving behind a void that could worsen the country's violence. MONUSCO's mandate had been extended last year, in December by a year, on exceptional basis of his intervention brigade. But the mission with more than 15,000 soldiers and police officers has been controversial, eliciting protests in parts of Eastern Congo where it operates. Butera says MONUSCO is entering its final phase in the DR Congo, and according to a plan set out in his report, the mission will have to begin an accelerated withdrawal, even though the security and humanitarian situation deteriorating sharply. And this is what we want to capture as well. And also looking at the front page of the East African this week as well, the future of EA mission in the Congo is in doubt. Uh, Kinshasa continues to sign bilateral defense deals as a plan B in the run-up to September expiry of regional forces mandate uh, glooms. We have the story on page 8 and 9 of the East African and also Kenya has shown a gesture, uh, if we may go by the words of the Defense uh, Minister, that also the mulling over withdrawal of the troops from the DR Congo. So what is the current state of play? Did we make uh, a very quick judgment on actually sending our troops in Dear Congo. Uh, no, we did not. Uh, the Congolese and the Rwandese are essentially the same people, divided by a colonial boundary, and about these boundaries have caused this conflict. Uh, we have spoken ad nauseum at how this, the people in Rwanda and the people in eastern <laughs> Congo are uh, all the same people. About this military intervention is to stop the bloodletting that has been going on in the DRC for 60 years. Kenya is doing its duty to the African Union and to the uh, values of the African Union. I'm proud of uh, our troops that are in uh, the DRC and I see absolutely no reason mm. why uh, these uh, uh, citizens of that country that we have gone to help with their peacekeeping should uh, make put in doubt the mission of the, Ke of the Kenya army. It is there under the auspices of our East African community, under the auspices of uh, peacekeeping. It is uh, essential for Kenya to stay there, uh, just as it is essential for Kenyans to make sure that uh, the DRC does not fall. Debal, if there is no peace peacekeeping troops and there is a war in the DRC, the Rwanda military will be in Kinshasa in a month. Mm. That military Debal is one of the most effective group of military organizations in the in, in East Africa. But the Congo the DRC does not have an effective military system. It is a, it is a giant it is the giant of Africa. It is the future of Africa. It is the heart of Africa. It is everything. The DRC Debal is what is going to transform our continent from electricity to um, uh, the export of uh, minerals, processed minerals. But uh, the problem today, Debal, is whether or not uh, Mr. Shikedi uh, will stand up to the values of uh, Patrice Lumumba. And what are those values, Debal? Debal, the, the, the values of the Lumumbaists in Kinshasa never saw um, the Rwandese or the Burundese or the Ugandese as a, an enemy to the DRC. Uh, the problem of ethnicity in the DRC, Debal, is a conflagration today. The system of elections that we're looking forward to uh, is now um, in shambles. Uh, the people of um, uh, the DRC, the Baal, are angry at uh, what uh, Rwanda is doing in the Eastern Congo by arming a rebel group uh, to fight the Interahamwe that escaped uh, into the DRC. The Baal, these things can be only solved at the table of uh, diplomacy at the table of negotiations. It cannot be solved by armed conflict. And Debal, let me tell you how strategically important this is. If there's a firefight in, uh, in uh, the DRC, Angola's troops will enter the DRC the next morning, Debal. Mm -hmm. 
Zimbabwe's troops will enter the DRC the next morning. Well, Kenya's troops might also enter. Forget about Uganda and uh, this has already happened before. The world. We cannot allow for there to be uh, a military war on people who are living on a dollar a day and who are poor. That is not a political economy of this continent. The political economy of this continent is to change those minerals uh, the way Botswana is doing into, um, uh, which we, Botswana now owns uh, part of the beers. I think it owns half because they're polishing the diamond that they're selling it in the economy and the government of Botswana is showing the way of what governance is in this continent. We have to get a handle on this thing. And I want to tell the chief of the general staff of Kenya, I'm shocked that he has not traveled to uh, the DRC. And if he has traveled there, uh, I would have known. Uh, and I apologize if, he, if I don't know. The fact of the matter is the, the chief of the general staff of this country has to go over there and may look at what uh, the people of the DRC are saying. And he needs to come and testify uh, to, the, to the parliament and uh, through the Minister of Defense to tell us what is going on in the DRC because we in Kenya want to know because our boys are there. They might be dying in a shooting war that might come. Debal, you know I'm very good at this prediction business. All right, let's just, I'm very let's... good at this prediction business and I'm telling you that they need to go there and find out because I believe that uh, the countries around the region are now getting very restless over this issue of peacekeeping and we ought to solve this problem. Mm. Right. So do you um, also um, agree or hold the view that uh, we should withdraw our troops since now we have the oh. final phase of uh, the UN mm. and we've, we've always been going under the, the ambit of the UN. Though at this particular juncture, we went as an East African regional bloc with uh, our forces there. But mm -hmm. should Kenya be withdrawing the forces why there? Why should we link the two? Mm -hmm. The two have never been linked. That question itself is confusing. You know why? They have not been linked. But of course, not if you have the UN, which no. is now saying we are withdrawing our troops because of security situation. It is not withdrawing should, its should. troops because of security situation. No, no. That's, Remember, that's what they say. But let's, the, let's put it this way. The security situation okay. in... Okay. But let's put it this way. Uh, MONUSCO, which has 17,000 troops, troops in Congo, is one of the oldest peacekeeping force in Africa. No, yes. And it's the symbol of multilateral colonialism of the continent. <laughs> it's been in Congo and there being no peace. <laughs> we only safeguarded the, the French and their interest to extract minerals from the Congo. That's all. There is nothing else that you, that you indeed. It never saved Rumumba. It has never saved anybody else after that. So what we have had is a general, uh, well, a camouflage of, you know, internationalism and the so-called uh, international community as they were rooting Congo. So let's not lead it means words as Africans, and we must be very clear about this. We have nothing against the French, we have nothing against the British. If you want to live in a, con in a co world community where people benefit from their resources and people govern themselves, MONUSCO has been the single force of enforcing Western interest in Congo. Absolutely. Now, when the East African community came in, it is genuinely interested in the freedom of the Congo. Maybe the way they are going about it is slow. They need to, assume, to look at the larger picture. And I've spoken to some of the people in, in this Congo, so called Congo mediation. Mm -hmm. uh, because the idea is to understand that it is the interest of Rwanda that forces Rwanda to be in Congo. It is the interest of Uganda that forces Uganda to be in, in this place. Also, the interests are might be economic, and we must recognize them as such. Now, so therefore, as the East African community is, uh, is meeting, it harmonizes its position in a manner that it has to use minimum troops. Because the, the East African community, I don't think, is interested in the, in the imperial extraction of cobalt and so on from Eastern Congo. Now remember, Congo is producing 90% of the cobalt in, in the world, mm -hmm. and this 90% is produced in one area called the Kivus. And, and that cobalt is at the base of the global technology mm -hmm. on, on, on storage, energy storage, the, the, the telephones that we are using mm -hmm. are all based on cobalt. And mm -hmm. how do you ensure the peace in, in the Kivus? Uh, the, which we are calling the Eastern Congo, with the interest that we have of the Europeans who want to extract these minerals. So we need to have the East African force there to guarantee peace. Absolutely. But at the same time, it has to be acceptable to the Congolese government in Kinshasa. 
It has to be acceptable to the Rwandese. It has to be acceptable. So it must be a force that is a consensual force. Remember, this is not the first force of the Africans we're having. We had the so-called uh, um, Lapid Response Brigade yes. that comprises of Burundi, Tanzania, South Africa, and others, yes. constituted by SADC, mm -hmm. because Congo is uh, seen to be part of the Southern Africa. But Congo has now decided it is part of, of East, East Africa. Africa. And, and, and there is a, there's a little tension there. The Rapid Response Brigade failed and left a rancor of animosity, particularly between Rwanda and Burundi, mm -hmm. between Rwanda and Tanzania, mm -hmm. and Rwanda and South Africa. Yes. It never united. It is disunited. So the East African force mm -hmm. need to stay. It is not in any sense connected to the United Nations force. Now, insecurity cannot be the reason why you are leaving a country when you went to put really security good. there. Yes. Uh, it is a contradiction. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I read that and wondered uh, how can it be an ins insecurity? Yeah, uh, insecurity cannot be a reason it's why you are leaving a country. You're because supposed to you are, you are supposed to, <laughs> you have the security. You have the security. It's an oxymoron. No, well, so who is supposed yeah. to go it's there? A <laughs> it's, a, it's a joke. It's a joke for the UN. But right. I, I think they have realized that their time is up. Is their brains have been <laughs> dry cleaned? They yes. have not been washed. Yeah, they have realized that their time is up. Yeah. They need to get out <laughs> of that country. They need to actually, as uh, Tom Boyer would, would say, they need to scramble out of Congo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and let the Congolese be. That's a good one. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Dr. Kanenza, yeah. they need to scramble out of Congo. <laughs> 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 On, on a lighter note, yeah. and uh, I, have, uh, I hope the French ambassador will not kill me over this. Yeah. Um, you know, Prof was speaking about uh, the MONUSCOs having foreign interests. Yeah. Um, so there was uh, this clip on TikTok, and uh, someone was asked a question uh, that what are the natural resources of France? Mm -hmm. Or what's the natural resource of France? Yeah. Of, of Niger. Uh, uh, no, of uh, France. France. No, of, of Niger. 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 Yes. Of Niger. And uh, the gentleman said, Uranium. Yeah. And we're asking what is the natural resource of France? He yeah. says it's Niger. Niger. <laughs> <laughs> it, was a, it was a nice joke. It's a I nice joke. It. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A really good yes. joke. Yeah, it's a very good joke. <laughs> yes. Uh, I think I do agree. Uh, there is no relationship between, you know, what the UN decides to do, or the East African uh, regional force is going to do. We were driven while we, both, both of them recognized the importance of uh, contributing to the stability and peace in the Congo. Uh, we are driven by, you know, very fundamental differences, especially with regard to how we rate our interests within Congo. The region, this is an, a, a regional national security uh, uh, issue. Uh, for Kenya, for instance, DRC has joined the East African community mm -hmm. and therefore is in Kenya's national interest to actually ensure that the, the neighborhood is, is peaceful. Now, just to give a little bit of, of, of historical outlook on this too, Congo has had some of the longest serving missions. Yeah. The f first Secretary General of the United Nations died in the Congo, mm. you know, in the 60s, Dark Hammarskjöld. Yeah, sure and it is a massive country with a lot of potential. Mm. It's more than four times the size of Kenya. It's a quarter the size of the United States of America with massive resources. But it's also a country that has been replete with lots of contradictions. Now, to the extent that the UN is living, is also a challenge now to Africans. Because mm -hmm. we've been relying, I think, a lot on the United Nations to come and save us. Then what happened to African solutions to African problems? We've come a long way, and we have certain capacities to be able to negotiate mm -hmm. things. You have the Nairobi process, a number of parties committed to things. How come? We've not, we're not pushing the parties to actually adhere to that Nairobi process so we can start moving in the positive direction. There is a challenge that is coming in the DRC. In a few short months, there are going to, there are going to be elections. Mm -hmm. I don't know how you start building a house during an earthquake. How are they going to have an election? Yes, because there are more than 100 uh, armed groups that yeah. are active yeah. in, in DRC, especially in the eastern part. It's going to be virtually impossible to have a free and fair election mm -hmm. in that type of environment. Now, but if the election were to happen, for instance, will it provide a room and reduce pressure, for instance, on Chisekedi to be able to talk to Kagame? Because there are two things. Kagame and Chisekedi's interests will have to be factored in, or at least Kinshasa and Kigali. Mm -hmm. 
because the problem in DRC, especially Eastern DRC, has a lot to do with the existential threat that Kigali perceives to be coming from, from Congo. Mm -hmm. And it's a question that we've been scatting around and not trying to address. Mm -hmm. Now, what should Kenya do? Because, you know, this is where the question also is. Kenya was the leader of the East African Regional Force. Kenya should remain leading this mission, mm -hmm. but should go beyond just, you know, using the hardware aspects of it. Mm -hmm. We should find a framework diplomatically to bring in other players to support these missions. These missions are expensive, and if you want to expand them in a way that's going to be uh, viable, you're going to need certain support. Mm -hmm. So as the UN withdraws, in part because there's fatigue in being in Congo, mm -hmm. but let's also be honest, uh, our Western partners, for instance, largely right now, the, the, the focus on saving key. Mm -hmm. Joe Biden was asking Congress for another $23, $24 billion. Okay, for, 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 for Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I've not seen anyone ask any of their country for $1 billion for the whole of Africa, especially in some solving conflicts, you know. And so there's less interest in actually trying to bring about this uh, a resolution to the conflicts within the continent, which means as the continent and as leadership in this region, mm -hmm. we need to be able to start doing something about it. And so that regional force, how can we make it viable, but also acceptable? What are the misses? What is it we're not doing right? Because right now we know because of the dissatisfaction, because some of the sentiments uh, that I think we've witnessed in this and DRC against Kenyan troops, it's not just coming from today, it's from the failure of foreign uh, such missions mm -hmm. to actually deliver, whether it's the UN or the other one led by the South Africans and the Tanzanians that did not really deliver. And so when we go in and these citizens don't see quick results, they say, you know what, we don't need you guys. But as a region, we have to decide, mm -hmm. is it Congo in a place where they can actually enforce that no. and, and order? It doesn't. So how can we be able to convince the leadership of the DRC, but also appeal on the leadership in Kigali that it's about time we started talking and there's no alternative to dialogue when it comes to I diplomacy agree. and peace. So what about this latest uh, developments uh, where we have uh, Anthony Blinken uh, calling on uh, President Kagame uh, regarding the fluid situation and the tensions now between the DR Congo and uh, Rwanda continues apace and he says uh, this needs to be addressed as it is right now. Well, this, this, this is the call that he made yesterday. That's exactly what I'm telling you. We're at the cusp of a massive war. Um, and if we don't do something about it now, I think uh, it's going to be impossible to do something about it later. And about, you know, when in the DRC, when something happens, millions of people move. Millions of lives are at stake. Millions of uh, people become refugees. Uh, I've, Africa cannot be the Golgotha of the misery of uh, the world's problem. The ball, uh, if the Americans are already shouting about uh, what is going on in the DRC and Rwanda, the ball, we ought to be absolutely uh, you know, seized by this matter. And by now, uh, I know Mr. Kenyatta is the one leading the mission to the DRC. I think that immediately the region's uh, leaders should come together and start thinking as to exactly how this issue is going to be solved once and for all. I know Mr. Kenyatta, uh, Kenyatta has gone to Rwanda, I know he's gone to Goma, I know he is doing his best um, and he's trying to reconcile these forces. But the, ball, the thing about it is, is very, there's two important things that needs to be done in the DRC. Rwanda needs to be stop being a Trojan horse for the West in, in that region. And the DRC has to stop uh, holding the entire Hamwe uh, inside the DRC, who have committed the genocide in Rwanda. And I think that those, uh, the Rwanda government uh, should not arm these uh, men in the DRC. We need to find a solution to this problem, and it is not very hard. The thing is that there needs to be some disarmament. Uh, instead of these missions being a peacekeeping uh, mission, they should start. They should do. They should take another role. Uh, they should absolutely change their mission. And I agree with my panelists. The UN ones should get out. Either we as Africans solve this problem, or we fail solving it. The, the entire problem, the ball of us uh, doing uh, diplomatic, uh, political, and security work, is the fact that we uh, do not have the panache 
to solve these things. If we get the resources, we can ask for the resources to try and solve these problems, as my friend there was saying. But it is our responsibility to solve these things. And uh, it can be solved between Mr. Kagame and Mr. Shekeli. And there's two sticking matters the ball is the Interahamwe in, uh, in Eastern Congo and the group that is being funded by the Rwandans to fight them uh, on, on the DRC soil. That is the issue and that needs to be solved. And when that is solved, about, there will be peace in the DRC. Mm -hmm. All right, Ivan Olaso on, on uh, no, we, DRC. We also need to recognize that it is not only the East African community that is intervening in Congo. Yeah. Congo is such a huge and resourceful country mm. that every country in the, almost every country on the continent has interest in Congo. So we have Angola mediating the, the, the yeah. crisis in Congo. Mm. In fact, it's a key mediator because mm. it's a mediator that you know, Rwanda is comfortable with. Uh, Rwanda, Angola has has mediated a uh, conflict between Rwanda and Uganda uh, about their border and it is the one that has actually been training Congolese to soldiers on, on that other other side majority of uh, you know uh, troops trained by African mm -hmm. countries are actually trained by uh, Angola uh, so Angola is a key player in the Congo on top of that we have South Africa and SADC they have interest there and we now have the East African community. I think within the ages of the African Union, uh, and I'm, I mean an African Union that is not control, externally controlled, because as it looks now, South Africa, I mean, the African Union that we created in 2000 is not the same as South, I mean, African Union we are seeing now. And it is time we start shout, I mean, I mean, shouting out the, the, the African Union that it's no longer the African Union we knew, it's a mouthpiece for Western governments that fund them. And we are not against the Western government, but it's good to respect the mantra of African solutions to African problems. Mm -hmm. If we have to respect that, and I, I honor our president uh, for the position he has taken on the African Union, we strengthen the African Union as a body that looks into our central policies, the centralized policies. And this was Kwame Nkrumah's idea in Africa Must Unite in 1963. So it's not, there's nothing new about this. And there's nothing ra radical about it. Uh, there's nothing radical saying that Niger need to be independent to have its central bank and deal with its resources and export its uranium to the world, whether it's in Africa or any other part of the world, as an independent country, and that the France should not determine how it's going to export its uranium. There's nothing uh, radical about that. It is affirming what ought to be. So the African Union need to shape up or ship out. Uh, we need to, to have a dialogue on the Congo. You remember in 1997, we had what was called, called the first Africa's First World War, where many African countries crashed in the Congo. Very unfortunate. Now, we need to have a collective dialogue on the Congo so that all the Congolese neighbors, all the neighbors of Congo, can come together and work together towards a united Congo because a, a strong Congo is basically the lungs and the heart of Africa. Yep. And, and if we have we, the, the, the runs are fall, collapsing and the heart is not pumping well, yeah. the continent can never be in good shape. Good question. Of course, also we had uh, the business of war that uh, was a splash on the front page of the Daily Nation. Just looking at uh, the 12 years of costly battle that uh, we have embroiled ourselves in when you look at. Uh, uh, the situation in Somalia, if we just pick up uh, the Daily Nation. This was a money edition, and they're giving very uh, interesting figures there. Yes, that after true. more than a decade of Kenya Defense Forces involvement in Somalia, total of 52 billion shillings has been spent on pro procuring weapons, oh, combat equipment, and equipping troops. But has the military intervention achieved its goal? That is a probing question. And figures are broken down here 4,660, that is Kenya's, or Kenya formally deployed some. 4,660 troops to Somalia in October 2011 following incessant attacks and abductions of civilians by Al-Shabaab militants on its territory. 1,000, that is uh, the figure they are given, that is Kenya recently deployed nearly 1,000 troops to the mineral-rich Democratic Republic of Congo at a cost of 4.45 billion shillings in f six months. And since KDF incursion into Somalia, Kenya has suffered three major attacks at Westgate Mall in 2013, Garissa University in 2015, and Dusit in 2019, leaving hundreds dead. And we're not even talking about what is happening currently 
in the North Rift uh, where we've seen uh, lots of uh, our soldiers, security uh, vehicles being blown up by Al-Shabaab as it is. So at what cost? Because many people will say uh, this is under the ambit of MONUSCO. It is being bankrolled by the United Nations. But here we are, the figures are given. 52 billion shillings and just in DR Congo, 4.45 billion shillings and still counting. Dr. Kanenji. There is no cost that is too high when it comes to protecting the country and our national interest. And I think that is something we need to, to be very clear about. 52, 54 billion, you mentioned? 52 billion 52 shillings. 52 billion. How many years? Over 12 years we're talking okay. about. Yeah, well, that is money that is stolen in one day in this republic, you understand, in, some, in a number of scandals. And it goes and it benefits no one except very, very few, few individuals. Good uh, yes, and, and, and so where if you have to put it, you know, in 10, 15 years, you, you know, you're going to realize that's actually minuscule. It's very little amount. Now, Kenya lives within a region. You can choose your friends, but you cannot choose your neighbors. And we found ourselves in this place by the, you know, the, the, the design of geography. We are where we are, and we live with the type of people we live with. When your neighbor is burning, and you can't, you can't do anything about it, tomorrow is actually going to be you. You see, from coming, for instance, from the Union of Islamic Courts to where the way transition into Al Shabaab in Somalia. A lot of times that's something that some was seen you know, as, as external. Uh, those are crazy people. They've been fighting wars forever. The truth is, the war was brought home. Right now, even just coming into this building, you have to get free and stuff like that. Why? Because of that consequence. And so we cannot say this investment is too high. In fact, it's actually too little if you have to put it in the, in the grand scheme of things. So Kenya's involvement in the region, or even in supporting the Somali government right now in trying to ensure a fight against Al-Shabaab, it is not a choice that they have to make. It's a necessity, the must and the duty that they have to accomplish. And any national government recognizes that irrespective of the president. Even President Ruto recognizes Kenya's important role. A lot of us what we've been arguing as, for instance, ATMIS comes, missions comes to an end, is what are we going to do next? Because we have to be honest with ourselves, our brothers and sisters in Somalia, they are not sufficiently prepared right now to run the security affairs of their country. We don't want to be an occupying force, and we've never really been, because we've been operating under ATMIS, and they are at Amazon and then ATMIS. But we have to be uh, live to the fact that we're living in a very fragile region, that instability in Somalia is always going to mean instability in Kenya. Right now, instability in Sudan eventually is going to come home to bite all of us in this region. What was happening in, in Tigray, part of the reason Kenya was involved in Ethiopia, because a potential implosion of Ethiopia is going to mean a lot of problems for Kenya. And it's going also to affect Kenya's larger economic agenda that involves its neighbors. And so uh, while this may be sensational, when we put the collective numbers together, mm -hmm. it's actually very low investment. And a lot of us call for even more robust engagement and more robust investment mm -hmm. in a way that is reasoned, in a way that is measured, but in a way that's calculating to be able to achieve the desired result. Of course, we cannot pursue missions ad infinitum. We must have certain objectives, but we must have strategies to achieve them. All right. Just of course, talking about mission, you're the one who was, uh, at one point, you were asking the question of a mission creep in uh, Somalia. Uh, Twelve years down the line, do we then categorize this as a mission creep? Our military has no exit strategy at all. What are we doing there? I think there's uh, a mission creep on steroids in uh, Somalia. Uh, I don't know what the policy is anymore. I really don't. I just know that there's troops there and they can't come out because uh, uh, the ball, the, the, the flip side of uh, my learned friend's uh, really exquisite an analysis of the situation, th there is a flip side to it and that's a flip side is called the responsibility of the Somalis themselves. You know, we, we, we are taking responsibility of our own country, Kenya, by going through talks, by making sure that uh, civil authority is working, that we are not going to have demonstrated. We're taking responsibility for our country. 
that uh, you know there's a very important thing the the leader of the dervishes uh, uh abdullah hassan said gobbana hayo gumirifisa in my own language which means uh, that there are people who are doing uh, uh, failing in their leadership and one of them is Colonel uh, Musa Bihi in Hargeza Nepal you know what is going on in Hargeza there's a militia there's a militia of uh, about thousand uh, thousand men who have climbed a hill and they are fighting the administration he has been bombarding uh, Las Anod and 200,000 people have gone into Ethiopia this man is a serious threat to the security of the region. What is happening in the middle uh, of Somalia? The president of Mog uh, the president has gone to a place called Dusamareb to go and take charge of the security. What president goes up to the ground to take charge of his armed forces? That means he doesn't have a, an army policy, he doesn't have a security policy, he doesn't have a defense policy. He's just running like a, on a wild goose chase. Uh, Debar, here in Kismayo, we have failed completely the buffer thing has failed and me and my learned teacher on the right have convinced each other of this uh, nonsense uh, through serious analysis uh, it is because that fellow over there who is part of al-shabaab has not built anything so the ball if we don't have leadership in somalia if we don't have leadership then the opposite coin of trying to make the country stable who are we going to hand over to the minute we leave there, who are we going to hand over to? We're not going to hand over to these irresponsible politicians who are there. They're going to mess up everything that they, 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 we have tried to do in Somalia. So we are calling here, uh, we are calling here for a leadership. We want leadership in Somalia. We want them to take responsibility for their, uh, for their country and to stop this uh, nonsense that they're putting the region through. All right, thank you. We need to also look at this picture here. Uh, if my director may just put, put it up in full. Uh, just following the developments uh, that uh, was there in uh, Ecuador, where we had uh, the presidential candidate, that is Fernando Villasicencio, uh, being assassinated. And so far, this is the latest that uh, we have uh, these six gentlemen who have been arraigned and arrested. Uh, they've been arrested uh, in connection with the assassination of a presidential candidate, Fernando Villasicencio. Uh, it's a mouthful for me there. But uh, it is just goes to show the letters that uh, is happening. Oh, and when it comes to uh, presidential and a parliamentary system, <laughs> the high tech that we normally take and put on the presidential system, it leads to such occurrences. Just briefly, this is in transition to, of course, what is happening in the, uh, in the, in the US. And uh, just to show you as well, there's a question there. The Trump's nightmare, we saw the proceedings that, uh, which is ongoing. Can prosecutors prove that he failed coup or the, his failed coup was a crime. Can prosecutors prove that his failed coup was a crime? And uh, that is the latest from the Newsweek US. And uh, the question also is what next for Trump? The criminal charges pile up, as you can see. So will he be sitting in the White House with his unflappable <laughs> smile or will he, will he be in prison <laughs> as well? But let's just begin from like Ecuador as we, as we go into mm. to the politics of <laughs> well, well, the very, U.S. as well. Very quick remarks. Uh, uh, you know, we, we've, we've transited too quickly, perhaps, uh, <laughs> super, supersonic <laughs> from, <laughs> from Somalia to, to, to America. Our minds need to settle down. <laughs> 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 so, <personally good. laughs> say something with Somalia, then we transition. <laughs> that was a, the concordance. It was the concordia. <laughs> what was that concord? That's what, that's, that's I, sir, I believe I can fly. <laughs> that's why we stopped the concord. Because uh, the concord. This yeah. is the concord. The supersonic. Yeah. yeah. That, Go ahead. That, that Panasonic uh, transition was. Uh, <laughs> but let me put it this way: that uh, in in Somalia, yeah, I've, I've been part to the production of two books. On, on, on by Kenyans mm. on Somalia, yes, yes. Uh, Operation Lidanchi, and, uh, and more recently, the War for Peace mm. in Somalia. Uh, you know, all, all work within the framework of KDF. And the, the main, main argument uh, was that uh, this is a war that Kenya never wanted to be in. Mm -hmm. yes. It is not a war we brought to ourselves, it was a war that was brought on our doorsteps. Mm -hmm. And no country, uh, if it's a country with its soul, can sit down and watch as, a, and as, as an invading force, mm. either faceless or with a face, uh, come to, uh, to your border and start basically uh, undermining your security. So we can stay in Somalia as long as we, as we feel that our 
you know, our security is not guaranteed uh, because we are not about to demolish our military. KDF is not about to be abolished from our constitution. And its sole mandate is to defend us from, uh, you know, external invasion of whatever form. And uh, the weakness in Somalia is there. Something else to mention as I go on is that uh, Amisom, it has been it said, oh, it, you know, we are in Somalia, we have overstated. The, no, Amisom actually came because the West neglected Africa. Mm -hmm. Remember from 1993, 1994, the West basically shut itself up for, for Somalia and left Somalia for the dogs. And I mean, IGAD sat down and agreed on a multinational force, which was called IGASOM. Mm -hmm. IGASOM is the one that, tra that transited into Unison when the African Union, because of its arrangement with the United Nations, mm -hmm. uh, agreed to basically form. But if you look at the constitution of, uh, of, uh, of now, um, we call it at, uh, Atmis. Atmis, it's basically Igasom. Yes. Because it's Kenya, Ethiopia, Djibouti, and so on. So it's, it's Igasom. Mm. And we have responsibility as, a, as, as neighbors to Somalia to secure our brother, not to occupy, because mm. neighbors don't occupy. They simply help the neighbors put the house in order. We do appreciate, despite what uh, you know, Ashi is saying, that uh, the current president in Somalia has taken the agenda of anti Shabab, uh, uh, um, Al Shabab, seriously. Yes. And, 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 and I think going to the front is basically to demonstrate his resolve. Mm -hmm. It's not that he's, he's uh, taking a gun and fighting himself, he's basically demonstrating his troops. Uh, Idris Deby uh, went died. to fight the resolves and died in, in, in that war in, in yes. Chad. So we want uh, Hassan Sheikh to remain safe. Uh, Al Shabab is not his war alone; <laughs> it is our war because we have to lead our region of all these uh, wise uh, old men. Oh, yes, yeah. very so, wise so, old men. So uh, Hassan, <laughs> Hassan Sheikh remain safe. Uh, let us fight this war. It's all our war. It's not your war alone. So now moving now to to to, to, to I, I don't know whether you are transitioning also yes. at a supersonic speed. Let me just put it in perspective so that now you muzzle everything up with hacking <laughs> us back to Somalia. Just on the latest development as well, that uh, uh, another grand jury, another indictment uh, for the fourth uh, time in as many months, former President Donald Trump uh, was charged on Monday with serious crimes and what was once unprecedented, unprecedented. has now become surreally amazing. routine. Amazing. The novelty of a former leader of the United States being called a felon has somehow worn off, not that the sweeping 98-page indictment handed up in Georgia accusing him of corruptly trying to reverse the state's 2020 election results was any less momentous, but a country of short attention span has now seen this three times before and grown oddly accustomed to the spectacle. And uh, just looking at this picture, um, it, it, it hacks us back to, maybe we can extrapolate this to our current situation, how it was the situation in the country in 2013, yeah. where we were wondering, will these two leaders, if they are put in office, Uru Kenyatta and uh, uh, Deputy President William Ruto be now ruling the country from the slammers uh, at the ICC. And you remember those editorial cartoons. <laughs> this is exactly <laughs> what we're seeing uh, playing out in the U.S. currently. But just to bring us up to speed with these felony um, cases against Donald Trump are still leading in the polls as far as the Republican side is concerned. Uh, what, does it, what does it tell? <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting to transition from um, an orange man in a red tie to an orange man in, a, in an orange suit. <laughs> um, <laughs> he's always uh, very orange. <laughs> as, uh, <laughs> you know, yes. Um, it is interesting and unprecedented, but I, I, I think we should not get very hysterical you know, about it. Uh, the U.S. has a system. And the uh, U.S. is also one of the most lit litigious countries, you know, the yeah, rest of the world. Mm -hmm. I would not be surprised, in fact, uh, to uh, see the verdict like what we got from the Supreme Court in the terms of the U.S. hot air. Mm -hmm. uh, in part because... Hot air. Yeah. Yep. This gentleman all has a zillion lawyers. Yes. And a lot of conservatives, he's actually leading. Mm -hmm. You know, he's a presidential candidate. And so they have interest in trying to ensure that he doesn't Just go to, to be that. clear, not to split hairs, he's leading on the Republican side. 
on the Republican side. Yes, yes. not generally but, as a presidential candidate. Yeah. Yes. yes. Very, but, but very he's important. correct in that. Yes. He, he, thank you. He's leading. But have you checked the last polls that were done with Joe Biden? Trump was doing very well. Oh. <laughs> was mm. actually ahead. Yes. You see. So he's not just a leading presidential candidate among the Republicans. There is still a chunk of Americans that say somehow, despite the job recovery in the United States, uh, it has been massive. They still do not feel that he has done sufficient to earn the second term. Now that does not help with his, doesn't help that he has, you know, frequent memory losses and then stuff like that, you know, and then he's falling and, you know, and all the like. Both of them are old men, they're geriatrics. However, just the picture of him has not exactly been positive. And so, uh, while liberal media right now, they are gloating and they're very happy with what is happening, when it comes to the actual facts to prove, it's going to be very, very difficult. And do not be surprised Donald Trump is still going to be in the ballot next year. And don't be surprised if he actually wins the presidency. I want to finish. concur with my friend on the right who is uh, very learned. Uh, when I was at the Foreign Office, I was asked by our Minister, Ambassador Amine, who was going to uh, win the American election. Mm -hmm. And I told him that uh, Trump is going to win with a landslide. And you could hear a pin fall in the room. Because even if you're, uh, if you're smart, you know, I don't consider myself to be that smart, you should have said Hillary was going to win, just to be on the safe side. But my, my analysis of the political economy of the Americans which is the, um, the Americans are a very conservative society. Mm -hmm. uh, going to New York is going on a vacation. Uh, New York is a foreign country yeah. for a person who's coming from, uh, say, Alabama. It's abroad. It's, it's abroad. abroad. Mm -hmm. And uh, you could hear the women in the New York Times, honey, here's the New York Tower. You know, people, uh, this, this country is huge. So the, uh, I, I predicted that Trump is going to win. I predict today that... Uh, 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 that uh, it is very, it's going to be a very close, close, close uh, uh, fight. But I think that uh, um, Trump is going to lose Florida. And uh, I think that's going to be the main battleground. If Trump wins Florida, he's going to win. If Trump loses Florida to the Democrats, he's going to lose. That's my, my thing. Peter <laughs> Well, I, I, I remember I predicted um, on, on Trump twice. I am <laughs> I am looking at the papers uh, at that time uh, during that is my November, you know, before the election of Trump. And the first time I predicted, everybody thought I was crazy. Yeah, they thought I was crazy the, too. Yeah, yeah, the second time I predicted and said I'm not going back to America because I was I was part of a I've been part of a, a major initiative called the Resolve Network, which is a, uh, researching violent extremism and uh, since Trump I've never gone to America almost by, by choice. The reason being that uh, I didn't support Trump mm -hmm. but that does not allow, I mean it does not mean that I cannot say he's winning mm -hmm. because it's good to give people a proper, uh, a proper warning. Now I think Trump was not defeated by Joe Biden let's be clear about that Trump was defeated by COVID-19 and the way he handled it. Yes. Without COVID-19, Trump, uh, Trump would have gotten a second term straight without any uh, hitches. Now that COVID-19 is over and Americans are getting back to jobs, <laughs> And the, and, then, uh, and the Democrats are fabbling around with an old guy, uh, you know, and uh, some other uh, busy bodies around, uh, Trump is coming back. And I cannot see anything that is going to stop Trump from coming back. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying this as a voodoo or as a voodoo prediction, which some of which uh, my brother is good at, uh, but uh, yeah. which, often, which <laughs> often turns right sometimes. It always turns right. I have no the, 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 the crystal ball watching. Now, so the, now the, the fundamentals of the American society have not been ch changed. The white dome or the white community in, South, in, in America is not assured uh, that it will have to control the levers of power in that country. That has not been made clear since Obama. Yeah. Obama basically the, the threatened the bastions of white dome in America. Uh, together with the, with the 
uh, Latinos and other immigrants. And therefore, the, the, the force that propelled Trump to power are still intact. They've not changed. Second, by just putting him in court the way they are doing, mm -hmm. they are producing a victim. And politics likes victim. William Ruto rode to power on the vote of Mount Kenya. And in Mount Kenya, it's because he was perceived as a victim of Uhuru's persecution and the, the betrayal uh, of a compatriot. And, and therefore he won. So Trump is going to win on the basis of being a victim. Mm -hmm. Now, even when these cases fall off, as uh, my brother has predicted rightly, even when they fall off, the way ICC fell off, mm -hmm. already the question of the trial of Trump is a referendum question in America. Yes. It, it, it is mobilizing people rather than demobilizing them. Watch my, uh, read my ribs. Yep. No Trump, new taxes. Trump, <laughs> Trump is the next president of the, of I think the we, I think we United States agree. of America. <laughs> Florida. Let's wait for Florida. That's uh -huh. my bellwether. All right. That's your bellwether. Refu <laughs> refusing to retire. Uh, that is what we have also the latest copy of the, of, uh, the week. Why the U.S. is governed by a uh, gerontocracy. And you can see Biden there holding court uh, with the, some of uh, the leaders there. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. And we can see Anasa taking also the, the vitals. Uh, who, that, who is that? If you, if you may help me with these faces as well. Uh -huh. yeah. Who is that? The majority. Majority, majority leader. leader. Yeah, this, this is the Senate. This is the Senate? Senate and the House. Huh? Yes. This is the Senate <laughs> right. and the House. Mm -hmm. And then the president. Remember, these are the three arms. Yes. Of, of the three main uh, bodies of the U.S. I think that was, that was supposed to be. All right. So, 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 so if, Trump, if, Trump, if Trump will be uh, leading from the prisons, uh, then this will be in the elderly care. They, they will be in, <laughs> in, a, in a retired people's homes. <laughs> what, the, what do you normally call them? <laughs> geriatrics. Yeah, what do you know? Not geriatrics. Uh, the what you, Nyumba, Nyumba, Nyumba yeah, Yawaze. Yeah, Nyumba Yawaze. Yeah, that's where you'll be leading from Nyumba Yawaze. I don't know how Biden yeah. is going to run a campaign. You know, the politics is a very rigorous thing to run a campaign in the United States. And Mr. Yeah. Biden is uh, turn, he's in his mid 80s or past his mid 80s. But mm -hmm. you can see the disaster of not having uh, Biden in the candidate because you're going to bring up. Yeah. In fact, I mean, uh, Trump will now win almost 100 percent because uh, the, the, the alternative to Biden is his, is his uh, uh, vice president. Mm -hmm. Who's not very and popular at all. Not popular in herself, but also nationally, uh, for, uh, nationally but also coming from the other side of, yeah. of, of the divide, yeah. so, which, which eventually or ultimately produced Trump. Mm -hmm. Trump was produced by, by, by anti-Obama sentiment yeah. yes. <laughs> among the white communities. Bath Batherists. The, yeah. the, the Batherists, yes. yes. And now you bring another Bather, uh, you, you are in trouble. So will, will, will also uh, Mike, Mike Pence be testifying against Trump? Yes, he will. I think the, Mike, Mike, Pence, the doc there. Uh, Mike Pence wants to get rid of Trump because he wants to run for the, Demo for the ticket for the Republicans. So the Republicans have one thing. They want to get rid of Trump. Trump is huge in the United States. People have no idea of how popular this man is. Oh, he, he could is. win an election in jail. Yes, you mean he's the Odinga of Kenya? No. He's, uh, <laughs> he's, not, he's, not, he's not the Odinga of uh, Kenya. He is the Odinga of, uh, of uh, the United States. Except there, you can't steal an election. <laughs> All right, we need to be winding up. Uh, let's just get to our closing remarks. Time is up. Uh, we do, Dr. Hassan <laughs> I, I, I think uh, I'm going to conclude by uh, a message to one, the Kenyan public and also to the Africans in general. Uh, you know, last week we commemorated the 25th anniversary of uh, the, you know, the attack, you know, against the U.S. Embassy in Kenya that killed a lot of Kenyans and wounded a lot of them. When it comes to national security, please let's not try to politicize things. Sometimes the president is going to take decisions that are not exactly in his own interest, but mostly in the interest of the nation. And some, some of those decisions should not be policed, they should be supported as such. We still live in a very dangerous and fragile region. As second, 
on a continental level, I think African leaders need to start listening to the African street. All of a sudden, things that are happening, including the conflict in Niger, before we decide to say, send forces there and invade them, we need to pay attention to exactly how Africans are feeling. Because from Nigeria, as well as Ghana, when you look at the street, they are not exactly for invading Niger. Mm -hmm. So we need to pay attention because the chickens are coming home to roost yes, over the crimes that have been committed for a very long time, yes. but also of our own inability as Africans to try and put in place systems yeah. and ask questions that provide answers. Why are these things happening? Why do they keep happening and how can, they, can we prevent them? But we cannot uh, solve these things by the force of arms. All right, thank you. Peter Kagonde. I, I think I want to remind ourselves of the article I wrote on 4th July 2020, uh, just before Trump came to power. And I said, th this was the second term. I mean, I, I, I mean, the first time. I said, Trump is coming. Africa needs, to st uh, needs strategy to escape recolonization. Uh, the concept of recolonization or continued colonization, which we call neocolonialism, is real in Africa. Uh, it has never awoken to me that there are parts of the continent that cannot be declared as free. Because if 80%, I mean, 100%, I mean 80% of your income goes to a, to a foreign country, and then you get the same back, 20% of it, with the interest, I don't know what colonialism is all about. And therefore, we in Africa cannot sleep, I mean, happy or quietly when parts of our continent is still under Absolutely. colonialism. Uh, of one form or another. Thank you. We, do, we don't need to take those coups in West Africa like military coups. These mm. are Africa's social movements yeah. mm. rebelling against, against exploitation, exploitation yeah. by external powers. Absolutely. And to, to us, these boys in uniform are uh, as good as boys without uniform fighting for the liberation. We do know that every liberation force in Africa, including Nelson Mandela, have been declared as terrorists. Yeah. These are not coup makers. Yeah, right. These are right Thank that you. Well, the, uh, I want to ask Briefly, the public we're secretary up. in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to look at the situation in Hargeisa. If Kenyans are safe there, he needs to call the liaison office into his office and demand to know what is going on in Hargeisa. The only stable part uh, of Somalia was Puntland and, uh, and uh, Somaliland. And now there, is a, there was a firefight uh, a while ago in uh, Garoway, and now it has come to Hargeisa. We need answers because there's a lot of Kenyans who are working there. We need to know if they're safe, and if they're not, they should come back. Right. Thank you, gentlemen. All of the Twitter having you on Wednesday to just uh, uh, give us a very insightful, immersive discussion on matters of foreign policy, security, and diplomacy. And the latest as well, of course, we have a new envoy, British envoy, who are, is just taking the reins as the British High Commissioner, High Commission. Of course, we see the exit of also of uh, uh, Marriott, that is the High Commissioner of British High Commission. We shall be giving you details of this much, much later, of course, next week. Thank you for your valid company, Hamid Hashi, Professor Peter Kagwanje, and uh, Dr. Hassan Kanenje. Thank you for your valuable input.